You're tuned in to the New Life Fellowship audio service. Here at New Life, we believe in facilitating a worship service that reflects the abundant new life that Jesus wants to give us in John 10.10. As you listen to today's sermon, feel free to share points that stand out to you on social media and use the hashtag NewLifeAU to join the national conversation. Enjoy today's message. In the powerful name of Jesus, we declare... We declare to the enemy that that I know is listening, that though our life is in shambles, and though there are a lot of tensions and anxieties, though we are juggling all manners of things in this place today, it is still going to be well. For everything that our God does, he does it well. And I just pray, oh God, that we would be able to hang in there just long enough to hear you say, well done, my good and faithful servant. God, keep us pressing and keep us pushing. May we hang in there. May we keep the faith. May we not give up. May we persevere. May resilience be ours. And may the power of the Holy Ghost reside on the inside of us. God, I pray that you would give each and every person under the sound of my voice the courage at some point today to turn their eyes to the sky and declare it's still well. I don't feel well. It doesn't look well, but it's still well. God, we just want to grab hold to the promise that everything you do, you do it well. And so I pray, God, that that blessing would be a part of our day for the rest of the Sabbath. May we say it is still well. If you want to say it's still well, could you just put your hands together? You just want to declare to the angels. Yo, I still believe it's still going to be well. I believe today in Kinetic Part 3, God wants to call some people out of a stagnant place, okay? I believe that there are people here today who are discouraged in their spiritual walk because things have just plateaued. They haven't been moving. As a matter of fact, many of you feel like you've been sliding backwards instead of traversing forward. I believe God wants to speak a word to you today that, with the Lord's help, is going to move you out of that stagnant place and help you find this really dynamic place of movement, kinetic movement. So I want to invite you to turn to Judges chapter 16, very familiar story. We're going to, though, look at a an aspect of this story in a little bit of a different way today. Judges chapter 16, this happens to be the Bible character that I feel like I identify with the most. There's just something about this guy that I'm just like, yo, man, I feel you. Every step of your journey, I just feel you. Judges chapter 16, we're going to read verses 26 and 30. Judges 16, verses 26 through 30. I'm going to read it from the New King James Version. It will also be available on our screen, beginning in verse 26. If you have it or can see it, say, I'm there. It reads, then Samson said to the lad who held him by the hand, let me feel the pillars. That's very important. Let me feel the pillars which support the temple so that I can do what? Come on, everybody. So I can do what? Lean on them. Verse 27, now the temple was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there. About 3,000 alone. Men and women were on the roof watching while Samson did what? Performed. We're going to skip verse 28 and jump to verse 29. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which supported the temple and he braced himself against them one on his right and the other on his left, finally finaleing with verse 30. Then Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed, he did what? Come on somebody, he did what? He pushed with all his might and the temple fell on the Lord's and all the people who were in it. I love this part, one of my favorite sentences in the Bible right here. So the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life. With the help of the Holy Spirit, I want to try to encourage you underneath the title, It's Time to Push. 
push. It's time to push. Heavenly Father, strengthen me so that I may avenge the realm of light for the souls the realm of darkness is taken. In the name of Jesus, amen. It's time to push. I think our society has kind of messed up our wiring, our psychology, whenever there's an opportunity extended to us. If you're honest with yourself, if there is a major opportunity that is extended to you, there's always a moment of pause or hesitation. You don't allow yourself to get uber excited right off the bat. No, no, why? Because you're trying to figure out if this is just an opportunity for someone else, or is this an opportunity for me? What you're really grappling with is this word called eligibility, eligibility. Because we've been disappointed so many times in our life, from the time of childhood to now, because we know what it's like to hear about an opportunity, to get excited, get our hopes up, get our dreams up, get our ambitions up, and then show up to take advantage of the opportunity, only to have someone tell us that we're not eligible. We are ineligible to experience this opportunity. Uh, we see it in different facets of our life. For example, some of you all were disappointed when you thought that you were eligible for the Pell Grant. Man, I can't get any financial aid witnesses in here. See, there's a difference between a loan and a grant. Can you say amen? It's a huge difference. And some of you showed up thinking, oh, I know my family ain't rich, and I know this university costs about at least three-fourths of my parents' salary. I got to be eligible for a grant only to hear the financial aid officer let you know that your parents make just above the limit for grants, but you do qualify for a loan. So you heard about a grant, but then you found out you were ineligible. Yeah, yeah. Uh, some of you have, have experienced this in the dating life. You know, we talk about eligible bachelors, eligible bachelorettes. So some guy or girl comes up to you, and they're presenting themselves as if they're eligible, right? As, as if there's somebody to be considered, as if they're a person that's actually going to benefit your walk and journey on this planet. Uh, but it doesn't take too long for you to find out that they're actually already booed up with somebody else, which, which is a little confusing, because I don't know why you came at me like that when you already got something for yourself. Uh, you can barely handle what you have. How can you handle me too? See, you find out pretty soon that, that they're not as eligible as you thought. They're actually ineligible. Yeah, that happens, and it'll continue to happen from signing up for courses for the academic year, only to find out that you don't have the prerequisites necessary to get the class that you need. You find out you're not eligible, or even time for graduation. Uh, may God bless advisors who don't do their job, right? Yeah, may God bless them. May he forgive them of their sins. Father, they know not what they do. And all of a sudden, I don't know why, but it's my last semester here, and you start telling me about stuff that I have to still take before I can be eligible to graduate. Yeah, see, this word eligibility is quite problematic, and it's why we pause before we take advantage of opportunities. The reason we pause is because we're not sure if this opportunity is for others or if it's also for me. Am I eligible? See, I think our hesitation is also bleeding into our spirituality. I think you hear from week to, on a week-to-week -week basis from different preachers, from different denominations. There are inspirational words being given concerning the Bible and its promises, and yet you hesitate to claim them in faith. Why? Because you're still wrestling with whether or not you're eligible. You don't know if this promise is reserved for people over there or if this promise includes people like me. Are there any people in here who just don't feel worthy of the promises of God? 
Let's just be honest today. Has there been any sermon that you've ever heard to where people were getting excited and encouraged? They were, they were jumping maybe, even, even shouting back at the preacher. But you sat there without saying a word because you didn't think what was being preached was for you. Must be for the righteous folk or for the folk that have gotten over their sins or for the folk that don't have no drama in their family or for the folk that feel well in their body. Preacher, I can't feel you today because I don't think I'm eligible for what you're talking about. But see, what I want to introduce you to is uh, two friends. Uh, they are the best friends of every believer. One is named Grace and the other one is named Mercy. Now, when you get to know these friends, you'll start finding out that grace is what happens when you get something good that you don't deserve. Grace is what happens when you get something good that you don't deserve. Mercy is there to back you up when you don't get something bad that you do deserve. Mercy happens when you don't get something bad that you do deserve. See, David, you might have missed it, speaks about these two friends and how loyal they are in Psalms chapter 23 and verse 6. He says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Now, you've heard that many times, but you missed the huge blessing that's found there. Notice that he does not say goodness and mercy guide me all the days of my life. Or goodness and mercy instruct me all the days of my life. See, those words would change the dynamic. It would make it available or opportune for you to keep up with grace and mercy, to work hard, to run at their pace. Uh, don't let them leave you behind. Notice that's not the dynamic of your two best friends. Grace and mercy are in front of you. Grace and mercy are always behind you, which means they go at your pace, which means they take it at your speed, which means it doesn't matter where you are, they're always there to follow you. This would also mean then that you can never get out of reach of grace and mercy because if they are following you, they're always within arm's length distance. If you had to follow them, be a different story. Now they can get too far. Maybe you can get too fatigued. Maybe you can get so weighed down with sin that you can't keep up the marathon race. But notice grace and mercy are always in an arm length distance because they follow you all the days of your life. Now, this is super important because I think what we're battling with in the church of God today, why many of you don't have a transformational faith, why you can't even receive the promises of God, is because you're not focused on the loyalty of grace and mercy. You're focused on the consistency of your mistakes. Can I repeat that? Because that just hit somebody. I know it. I know it. Somebody felt that word. That was for you. That's the reason God brought you here. You've been, you have not been focusing on the power and faithfulness of grace and mercy. Instead, you've been focusing on the consistency of your mistakes. And because you're always mired down with thinking and processing through your mistakes, you start thinking you are ineligible to receive the promises of God. Oh, man. God, how can it make it clear? How can it become clearer? Uh, let's, let's look at Samson. Yeah, he knows what you're going through. For in Judges chapter 16 to verse 26, it reads this way. Then Samson said to the lad who held him by the hand, let me feel the pillars which support the temple so that I can lean on them. Now, don't miss this. Why? You got to ask yourself the question. Why is Samson asking to be placed at the point of the central pillars of the temple? It's because Samson has a divine idea. Samson has a divine idea. He's thinking to himself, I'm tired, but I really am not physically tired. As much I, as I am tired of being captive to this stronghold, 
This stronghold has been hovering over my life for years now. I've been judging Israel for 20 years, but to be honest, before I even accepted the call on my life, there was this stronghold there. I'm tired of dealing with this stronghold. Place me between the two central pillars. What's his idea? I think Samson is trying to figure out if God will bless me to get the victory over this stronghold. Is there a way that I might be able to summon the strength to push this stronghold down? Now, why this is so major is because although he has an idea, he has to wrestle with the fact that because of his decisions, he's now a shell of himself. He knows when he looks in the mirror, he's no longer what he used to be. He knows when he looks in the mirror, he doesn't look like God wants him to be. He knows when he looks in the mirror that that angel that came and visited his mother and his father and declared this will be the tool that I use to deliver my people from the hand of the Philistines. I will start the deliverance process with Samson. And yet when he looks in the mirror, he has chains around his wrists and his ankles. He's not delivering Israel from the Philistines. He's actually a captive of the Philistines. How many of you know within the depths of your spirit that there is something that has you captive and maybe has had you captive for many years? What is it? What is it that you think about when you look in the mirror and you start noticing that you're a shell of what you're supposed to be? Mm. This is difficult. You know why it's difficult? I believe it's difficult because when we look in the mirror at ourselves, especially when we're considering our spiritual journey, we always hear a voice whispering to us about all of the things we should have done. All of the chances that we have been given. Listen, you have probably a stronghold in your life that if you were to count the times that you were uh, uh, brought back into the confines of that stronghold, you would have to admit that that number reaches to the level of hundreds. And you know it's there in your life. And that thing just keeps creeping up on you. And it zaps you of spiritual authority and divine energy. There is no kinetic movement in your experience because you're still wrestling with this stronghold. You're a shell of yourself. You can admit that if somebody called on you today to do, some, to, to do some miraculous work for Jesus Christ, that you would hesitate to step forward. And it's not because you don't trust Jesus as much as it is you don't trust yourself. See, Samson got into the place in his experience where he knows he no longer can trust himself. I've had many chances. I was even with a prostitute, and God fell upon me and delivered me when I was with a prostitute in the land of my enemies. I'm supposed to be fighting against this stronghold. Instead, I'm collaborating with this stronghold. And I believe there have been some partnerships made in this space with strongholds. You have given in to those strongholds. You believe there is no way, there is no how I'm going to get free of this stronghold. And you keep looking at your experience saying to yourself, Dang, the only consistent thing happening in my life is my failure to do this. My failure to abstain from that. That is the only consistent thing about my spirituality. I'm just a shell of myself. Don't talk to me about promises. Don't talk to me about God's plan. Preacher, stop saying he wants to take me from potential to actual. I'm not trying to receive that. Because I can't get out of this stronghold. And yet, Samson has this idea. He can't see, and he's wandering around. But then he feels the hand of a child grab his hand. Hey, mister, where you want to go? 
take me, take me to the center of my stronghold. Now walk, walk me to the center. I want to know where its foundations are. I want to feel the main pillars of this temple that's been erected to a false god that, that, does, not, that does not give what, what Yahweh has promised to give, that we will not save as Yahweh promises to save. I'm incarcerated. Take me to the center of my stronghold. And it's that type of desperation that I pray is injected into your spiritual experience today. Somebody needs to call out to God. God, where is the foundation of my stronghold? What keeps holding me back? Why do I keep falling? Why is it that I can't get the victory? God, I'm a shell of myself. I'm not spiritually strong. I don't believe in your promises because I am still stuck in this stronghold. I'm incarcerated, but I need you to take me to the foundations of my struggle. See, there's divine potential in each and every one of us. I promise you that God birthed you with a plan. He birthed you with a divine purpose. You've heard that many times, though. The problem is you keep hesitating because you don't know if you're eligible for that plan. You don't know if you're eligible because you're still struggling with this stronghold. Some of these strongholds are your fault. Some of these strongholds are based on your bad decisions. Others of these strongholds are not your fault. These are the things that happen when, when we are just in a world of sin and we find ourselves in tough circumstances. It doesn't matter if this stronghold is your fault or is not your fault. There is still divine potential in you. And I want you to see this. I want you to see this. In Judges 16, verse 25, watch this closely. It says, so they called for Samson from the prison. They called for Samson from the prison. The first thing you need to receive today is that God, whenever you feel the call of God on your life, he is a master at calling people from prison. What you've been thinking in your spirituality is that you have to get out of prison first. That once I get free from this thing, then that's when I'll be able to walk in strength and authority. But my Bible doesn't say that Samson answered a call when he was free. It doesn't say that God called him when he was liberated. The Bible says that he called him from a prison. And there's somebody in here who needs to receive this today. God is a master at using prisoners. Oh, you don't believe me? Didn't he call Joseph from a prison? Did he not do it? Is he not calling Samson from a prison? Did he not call Esther from the prison of a harem? Did he not call Daniel from the prison of being a refugee? Doesn't God call us from prisons? Did he not visit John the Baptist in prison? Was it not James, Peter, and John that did some time in prison? What about Jesus? Was it not Jesus called to his grave? Greatest work out of prison. God is not asking you to get free, then follow him. What God is asking you to do is to believe that he still uses prisoners. Are you incarcerated today? Is there a stronghold that you can't get the victory over? Grace and mercy is following you. Because God is a master at calling people from prison. But here's the other thing you might have missed. It says in Judges 16, 28, then Samson called to the Lord saying, oh, Lord God, remember me, I pray. Now, this is huge. Because what Samson is praying for, please listen to this. Samson is not saying, God, because I made a mistake, I think you forgot me, and because of that, I need you to remember me again. Just because you make mistakes doesn't mean God forgets. But specifically, even when you make a mistake, God doesn't forget his original design. What Samson is saying is, God, I'm a shell of myself now, but please remember the me that you made. 
Please remember the person that you fashioned in Manoah, Manoah wife's womb. Please remember that you constructed me for something. Yes, I squandered it. Yes, I haven't been faithful. But God, please remember, don't forget why you made me. Don't forget that you once called me. Don't forget about me. Don't forget the plan that you had for me. Thoughts of good and not of evil to give me a hope and a future. God, I know, I know I've made mistakes. I've, I've, I've backslid and I've, yes, I, all of that is true, God. I admit it. I confess it. But if there's something I need you to do, I need you to remember me. Don't remember the me you see now. Remember me, remember the version of me that you saw when you first thought of me. Remember that me. Remember the potential that you had in me back then. Remember that plan. He says, Lord, remember me. Because Samson realizes that maybe God can move me from potential to actual, not based on what I am in the present, but based on what he did a whole long time ago in the past. So you only think about the immediate past, but you never think about the eternal past. I know that's an oxymoron. Eternity has no past, right? No, there is an eternal past. There's a past that existed before our planet existed. And before our planet existed, you existed in the heart and mind of God. And you need to start praying, God, remember that part of me. Remember that version of me. So Judges 16, 29 moves the narrative on, and it says, I love this phrase. It says he's at the foundation of his stronghold, and what he does is he begins to brace himself. Now, I like that because that's in our vernacular. We can feel that. We've used that phrase before. You need to brace yourself. What do we mean by that? Well, according to Urban Dictionary, bracing yourself means simply this, to prepare yourself for a strenuous or uncomfortable experience. So when he's bracing himself, he recognizes that me getting the victory over this stronghold is not going to be easy. It's not going to be comfortable. It's not going to be something that just strolls along. It's not going to be as easy as somebody waving a towel over me and all of a sudden I'm free. It's not going to be that easy. It's going to take some arduous work. It's going to take consistency in prayer. It's going to take intercession from fellow believers. It's going to take a long-term commitment. Oh, that hurts. We don't like that word. That's why our generation, unlike any generation before us, has the lowest rates of marriage. Marriage. Why aren't we getting married? No, stop that narrative that there's nobody good out there. Nope, that's not what the researchers are telling us. It's not as if all of a the sudden there are no spouses out there. It's that all of a sudden we don't want to commit to a long-term process that's going to call us to brace ourselves. We keep wanting God to speak a word of deliverance and for us to be delivered and walk out of that stronghold without any chains, feeling great about ourselves and our life. No, my friends, it is going to take some strenuous work to be delivered. All that God says, though, is here's the promise he gives to you. It's not going to be easy, but he says, for it is God that works in you both to will and to do what pleases him. So what he's saying is it's going to be a lot of work, but it's going to be a team project. This is not a solo venture. No, this isn't tennis or boxing. It's not you out there just trying to maintain. No, this is team sports. This is when I get a crew of people who are going to fight this thing with you. And that's why you got to come out of the closet when it comes to your stronghold struggle. Stop keeping it to yourself. I decree in here that anybody who has the courage to confide in somebody else and say, I got a stronghold problem, that you will find yourself strong strengthened and encouraged by believers who are willing to fight with you. The Bible says to bear one another's burdens. Maybe the reason we don't get victory over strongholds is because we keep trying to fight them by ourselves. How many people know 
about the stronghold that is draining you of your spiritual vitality. How many people know? And those people that do know, how many people have you told and given them permission to hold you accountable? Have you ever looked at the word accountability? It's a compound word made of two words, account and ability. Have you ever noticed that? As any business major in here who's taking accounting would know, that the field of accounting is all about measuring what should be against what is. This should be here. Now let me see what is here. That's accounting. And what you need to do is you need to surround yourself with people who will look at the divine potential that God has put in you and start measuring what should be based on what is. You need to stop telling people, don't judge me. Listen, who are you to tell me? Man, stop all of that. That is from the pit of hell. What you need to do is say, listen, I give you permission to call me out about my stuff. I give you permission to start telling me what God has planned for my life. I give you permission to start lifting me up when I'm weak and holding me down even when I'm strong. I give you permission to look at what is and compare it to what should be. You don't have accountability partners. That's why you don't get the victory over strongholds. Instead, we are content with performing. Did you notice that narrative in the story? That they called Samson to perform for us. Ah. How many of you are just performing in your spiritual journey? Just performing. It's just entertainment. It's just momentary. It's not consistent. It's not a lifestyle. I'm just performing. See, Samson, I give him props. He finally got tired of performing. He got tired and fed up with just going through the motions and putting on a show for people. He says, I'm tired of putting on a show while I'm still in my stronghold. What I need somebody to do is to lead me to the pillars so that I might lean on them. The person that receives this word today, you need to brace yourself because life is not going to get easier. Because enemies never let their prisoners just leave. This is a, this is a spiritual battle. And the word of God says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, not natural, not physical, but they are for the pulling down of spiritual str uh, strongholds. There's something about spirituality that you're going to have to grapple with. You're never going to get just a manual in your hand that just outlines the steps perfectly for your journey. Because then you will need faith. You got to go out there and be willing to take the journey and the adventure of getting free. And as I look at the story, as the musician begins to play, I give Samson props because he never contented himself with just performing. In his case, he even allowed the Holy Spirit to hold him accountable. I like how in Samson's prayers, he never says, he never says, God, why'd you put me here? He never says that. He owns it. He just says, remember me. And getting free from his stronghold became such a desperate goal for himself that he had this divine idea. Maybe God will strengthen me to push it down. But here's the thing. Judges 16 and verse 30. It says that he pushed with all his might. And then the temple fell. Now, this is very important, and most people won't catch the subtle nuance here is when you first start pushing, you never push with all you have at first. It's, it's, it's you push, and then nothing's moving. So you brace yourself, and, and you push hard, and nothing's moving. And then you just get angry, and you just keep pushing, and nothing's moving. See, when Samson started pushing, he didn't know he was eligible for this promise. 
He did not know if God was going to come through. He did not know if he could get freed from this stronghold. All he had was faith. And that's why he's mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. Because he pushed by faith. He couldn't see, so he couldn't push by sight. All he had was this belief that maybe God will remember what he made and strengthen me one last time. And the Bible says that he just, he bore down and he braced himself and he said, I will be free. I will be free. And he pushed with all of his might. And that's what God is calling you into. From, from potential to kinetic, from potential to actual, from potential to real, it's going to take a whole lot of pushing. It's going to take you gritting your teeth, bearing down, bracing yourself, and pushing by faith. I know you haven't gotten the victory before. I know you're still trying to figure out if it's possible now. I want you to believe as Samson did. That made a lot of mistakes. But maybe goodness, maybe grace will help me push on the left. And maybe mercy will help me push on the right. Because maybe they still are following me. Maybe they're still there to help me. Maybe they can help me push down my stronghold. And the secret of Samson's story that I love is that he got his greatest victory at his lowest moment. For it says in the Bible that he killed more in his death than he ever did in his life. And I want to suggest that, that the beauty of Samson's ending, where many of us have looked at it as a tragic ending, I see some encouragement there. Why? Because it is in this moment that Samson looks most like Jesus. In his lowest moment, he is strengthened to look most like Jesus. Why do I say that? Well, if you fast forward a few thousand years, I believe the gospel is very clear that Jesus won his greatest victory, not in his life, but it was in his death. That we serve a God that can strengthen you to be your greatest when you are at your lowest. And so the apostle declares in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my greatest grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect. Not when you're perfect. Not when you're obedient. Not when you're feeling great. Not when you're feeling like everything is cool. My strength is made perfect in your weaknesses. I'm going to show you the power of grace and mercy by transforming you in your lowest, weakest moment. For when the angels saw Samson, I don't think they just cried because they lost a great champion. I think they cried because they knew what he represented. They cried because they say, that's what the Messiah is going to do. And in his death, he gave the greatest testimony of his entire life that God can give us the greatest victory in our lowest moments. It is time to push. It's time to push. This is not a word that's, that's guaranteeing this easy deliverance stuff. Name it and claim it. Nope, I don't receive that. I don't buy that. It's going to take some time. And it's going to take some work. It's going to be uncomfortable. And at many cases, it'll be painful. But I believe that if you brace yourself and push, that grace and mercy will give you victory over your stronghold. And so at this time, I want, I want to call for a very special time of rededication to just pushing, just pushing. Maybe that's all God ever wanted. You've been thinking he wants you to get victory. Maybe all he wanted you to do is just keep pushing. For the word of God says that Samson pushed with all of his might, and then the temple fell. At this time, I want you to just bow your heads. I want you to bow your heads where you are. I want everyone to close their eyes.
And what we're going to do is we're going to confess, maybe even to a stranger, that we are we're struggling with a stronghold. If that's you, all I want you to do is I want you to take your hand and I want you to touch the shoulder of someone to your left or to your right. Please keep, keep your eyes closed. If you are struggling to get victory over a stronghold, I want you to touch the shoulder of a person to your left or your right. Like, man, that's me. I'm, I'm Samson. I'm still stuck in the middle of this stronghold, and it's draining my spiritual vitality. I, I, I often question whether I can be eligible for the promises of God because I just can't seem to get the victory. I want you to be transparent and touch the shoulder of someone to your left or to your right. I'm struggling with a stronghold. And now what I want is if your shoulder was touched, don't open your eyes. I just want you to start praying on behalf of the person that touched you. I just want you to start praying for them. God, give them victory over the stronghold. God, remember them. Not the current them. Remember the them that you destined, you predestined. Remember the them that you constructed. Remember the plan that you have. Please remember them, oh God, and strengthen them to brace themselves for this struggle. I want you to start praying on behalf of the person that touched your shoulder. Come on, please take it serious. Intercede. We are now going to bear one another's burdens. Intercede on their behalf. Strengthen my brother. Strengthen my sister. Give them victory over their stronghold. Be the strongest in their life at their lowest and weakest moment. Give them the courage to stop performing. Bring to them accountability partners. Remember them, oh God, please. Remember them. And now we're going to turn your attention inward. If you're trying to get victory over a stronghold and you need to let God know, hey God, I'm, I'm gonna rededicate myself to keep pushing. I, I don't know when I'm going to push this temple down. I don't know how fast that victory is going to come, but I'm going to rededicate myself to pushing again. Then I, want, I just want you to kneel where you are, right there in your pew. I just want you to kneel. You're kneeling before God saying, it's me, oh Lord, it's me, oh Lord. I'm standing in the need of prayer, God. I'm just, I'm kneeling right now. I got a stronghold that I'm trying to get the victory over. Show me the foundations of my stronghold. Show me how this stronghold was built. Give me the secret to it. Please show me the blueprint so I can get victory. God, give me some accountability partners to help me push through this struggle. God, please remember what you made. Move me from having potential victory to having actual victory. You're just on your knees right now. Take it this time to say, God, I, I want to get the victory over this stronghold. And I dedicate myself to pushing until it falls. God, we're all kneeling together. Those who have felt compelled to recommit themselves to the push that is required to gain victory over their stronghold. I thank you, God, for giving us two friends that will always be there to push with us, goodness and mercy. 
always following us, always being there to assist us, always encouraging us to keep going and to keep striving. God, I'm, I'm praying in the name of Jesus that those who are on their knees now would find within themselves a renewed fervor to push, that they would find within themselves a resilience and a perseverance that they did not have previous today. God, I pray that you would restore to them what has been taken by sin. For the prophet Job declared, I will restore the years that have been taken, and my people will not be ashamed. God, give us the victory over shame and guilt. Give us the victory over fear, for your perfect love is going to cast out all of our fears. God, take residence in us. Give us the power of the Holy Spirit. May the Spirit fall upon us for the cause of liberty. We don't know when we'll get the victory. And some of us may even go to our grave still pushing like Samson. But God, we want to re recommit ourselves today that no matter what happens, no matter what the addiction is, no matter what the rejection scar is, no matter what the failure disappointment is, God, no matter what the abandonment was, no matter what the sin is, we are going to keep pushing. Because we believe your promises are for prisoners. For your word says you came to set the captives free. And I pray in the name of Jesus that that supernatural resilience would be given to those who are on their knees in this moment. I ask that you would hear their prayer. That you would forgive their sins. And that you would heal their land. In the name of Jesus, we claim it. Amen. Thank you for listening to the New Life Fellowship audio service. We pray that today's message was a blessing to you and that you will continue to tune in. New Life is located in the Seminary Chapel on the campus of Andrews University, and our services are held every Saturday at 11.45 a.m. Keep up with the latest information about what's happening at New Life by subscribing to our podcast on iTunes and through our social media connections on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Simply type in New Life AU in the search bar, and you'll find us. Until next time, may the Lord bless you with a new love, new integrity, new faith, and a new experience.